All right, welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is on one of my favorite topics. Explicit instruction. Now, explicit instruction, at least in my mind, and bear in mind this is just my personal opinion, is really just another word for good old fashioned high quality teaching. It's the universal teaching method that's used across the world. Uh, I've been in classrooms in multiple different countries, including third world countries and uh, developing countries, sorry, and explicit instruction is just used everywhere. There's no doubting that. Whether you're one of those people that are more into the modern constructivist type approaches, you'll still use aspects of explicit instruction. So it's worth knowing. I'm of the opinion that, yes, explicit instruction is a bit more old school, a bit more conservative, I guess you could say. It's used a lot in the acad more academic um, fields. Um, and subjects like your traditional subjects, English, math, science, and so forth, at least as a backbone foundational strategy that underpins a lot of the structure that you'll find um, in those courses and in those lessons. Now, if you're a teacher, you need to know not only what explicit instruction is because you're probably already using it, and if you're not actually using it for 95% of your lessons, which I think a lot of people will be, you will certainly be using a significant number of the main aspects of explicit instruction. And I've written a few of them up there. There's only a few of them, and I'll explain what those are as we go through this particular webinar. Now, if you're uh, working as a support worker of some description, whether that's a teacher aide or a teacher assistant or a learning support officer, or a paraeducator, a school support officer, you will need to know explicit instruction because not only do you need to know what the teacher is doing, you need to know how you can integrate yourself into that lesson to provide the best possible learning support that you can. But also, you will use various aspects of these, and in fact, the actual explicit instruction model for when you go through and work with students in small groups, whether that be a literacy program or uh, some type of program that you run to the side, helping students catch up if they've been away or are falling behind, like in a remedial program, for example. Um, but otherwise, you still use explicit instruction if you're helping an individual student who just needs 10 minutes of help to catch up or to learn something that they're otherwise confused with. Okay, so what exactly is explicit instruction and how would you define explicit instruction? Well, in a way, it's in the actual title or in the name of the strategy. So firstly, it's got to do with instruction. Now, instruction is very, very what we call teacher-led. So there are two types of strategies, teacher versus student-led strategies, as far as teaching and learning strategies and activities are concerned. Now, I didn't really leave myself enough room here. Generally, we talk in terms of uh, teacher-centered and student-centered strategies. Now, explicit instruction is very teacher-centered, and it's used by a lot of teachers in primary schools, high schools, trainers in the adult sector, um, particularly when there's large numbers of students and there's content that you need to get through at a relatively fast pace. Now, the interesting thing about uh, explicit instruction is that it also involves a lot of student-centered work as well, but not to a as much, not to the same extent that teachers who prefer to use a student-centered approach, such as those who work for uh, alternative systems like Montessori or Steiner, um, or in the early childhood sort of area. Um, explicit instruction is still used in a lot of those areas um, and a lot of those different organizations anyway, um, even though a lot of teachers or 
uh, teacher aides wouldn't like to admit it because explicit instruction is kind of, the, the general feel is that it's associated with that old school type of teaching. Um, there are some new types of explicit instruction out there these days, which um, such as explicit direct instruction and simply direct instruction or DI. And there's a couple of different versions of that as well, but we won't get into that in this particular uh, webinar. They're just different takes Really, they're different takes on explicit instruction. That's how I see it, although it depends on your opinion and viewpoint on that. It's a something of a contentious issue in the education world um, at the moment. So um, firstly, it's about instruction. Instruction means you're doing a very teacher-led activity and passing on information to students. So that's the first part of it. Also with instruction, it's not just instructing other people or uh, those who have lesser knowledge than yourself. It's not only about instructing them, but giving them those opportunities to practice and to acquire that knowledge and to train themselves and learn and um, um, uh, acquire new skills. Um, now, explicit means that the teacher or teacher aide or whoever's teaching that class or that small group activity or whatever it is, is very explicit in what they want students to know. So this is an important concept here. Um, what you want, exclamation marks. Now what that means is, is the teacher at the start of the lesson will say to students, this is what I want you to be able to do. This is what it looks like. This is how we're going to go about the process of learning to be able to achieve this particular outcome or this particular product or whatever it is, this particular goal. So it's very explicit. It's very transparent. Those goals are very specific. They're smart goals. I'll write some strategies and stuff down the side here. I talk about smart goals all the time. So very important. So they use smart goals. Um, and when I use explicit instruction, I write it on the board. This is what you need to know. So um, I've done that exactly here. These are the main points that you need to know. And I'll go through a lot more points because there's some other ones that I want you to um, start thinking about as well. But the general idea with explicit instruction is that it's very teacher-led, it's very fast-paced, it's very structured, it's very controlled. Um, and it's very, very clear to students what they need to learn in that particular period of time. So the first thing to bear in mind with explicit instruction is that it's highly structured. And what that means is, we'll skip to this point here, is that activities are very short and sharp. So that means that, for example, in a planning, I'll come right, uh, I'll do it here. You might have zero to three minutes, three to six minutes, six minutes to 10, 10 to 20, and so on and so forth. So let's just say you are planning this out now. Some people will plan this out in their head. Others will um, uh, just naturally go with the flow of it, especially if you've got a bit of experience around explicit instruction. But a lot of people will also quickly jot this down on a piece of paper. It sort of gives them a bit of an idea um, of what they want. So that might be just the get organized part of the lesson. This might be the you know sitting kids down, all that kind of stuff. The three to six minute period could be something of a link. So building on existing knowledge, linking previous knowledge to current knowledge, revision, what do we know, what have we learned in previous lessons and so on and so forth. So a bit of a revision. And again, you can see short, sharp activities. That's really one of the big keys is that short, sharp um, uh, momentum. Now, if you've watched some of my behavior management videos as well, you'll see that a lot of behavior management problems are caused because of incorrect or improper or not quite best practice teaching strategies being employed. And that means students get bored or it means they're frustrated or it means they're not keeping up, they're off task. Um, so explicit instruction is one of the best teaching strategies that you can use to boost students' motivation so that they can achieve goals, so that they can boost their self-esteem. Because if students are achieving little micro goals here and moving through with a fast 
paced, fast momentum lesson. They don't have time to muck around, to go off task, to start chatting to their friends and so on and so forth. So explicit instruction is a really good teaching strategy if students are um, off task or misbehaving quite a lot. Okay, so we'll do the link in the revision. Now, once you've done that, you might do some modeling slash uh, worked examples. Okay, worked examples. Let's say that takes four or five minutes on the board. It might take 10 minutes or so. You might do 10 minutes here where you're doing um, individual practice. Individual practice. Now, with individual practice, there's a few different ways you can do it. Generally, I would I would probably, if I was doing this, I'd actually make that 10 to 30. That seems like a lot of time to do individual practice, but I might um, divide that down into several different activities because you'll have it where it's, you'll have a process where it is individual add uh, op Oh, let's go opportunity to whoop, respond. So that's that one there, an opportunity to practice as well. So what that base, sorry, that would be practice. And I'll explain what that means because I know it's a little bit confusing, but opportunities to um, practice. Confusing myself here. Okay, so now what this basically means is that let's say we were doing a maths problem. Um, now, the first thing you would do is get students, if we were doing some modeling here, so the students know how to go through and do the process, and you would get them to do some individual um, practice on their own. So, But you would structure it out so that they would answer a single question, give them 20 seconds. There's a lot of timing is another one, uh, which I've written timed. There we go, timed at the end there. So everything is, not everything, but generally there's this idea to push the momentum of the lesson along quite quickly to keep that level of excitement. You would be not timing it, but giving students short, sharp periods of time which to complete um, individual uh, activities and problems. So in this case, you might say, okay, everyone, I want you to work this question out here, six plus two divided by one times four, add seven, something like that, all of that divided by three, I don't know. So students are going through and working that problem out. You might give them opportunities to practice uh, that for, say you give it right, you got one minute, go, and they can go off and try and figure that out. 60 seconds later, you then come back um, to the teacher-centered perspective and ask students to come up and do what is step one, what is step two, what is step three, and spend two or three minutes, five minutes, whatever it takes to work through that particular question. And then you might repeat with a second question or a third question. So you might get rid of that two, change that to a six, change that to an eight, um, change that to an eight, uh, change that to a 2.5, let's make it harder. So anyway, the point is that you're going through and you're doing one activity, then the next activity, then the next activity real quick, one after the other. 60 seconds or 30 seconds to practice, do it on the board, go on with the next one. Maybe you could do two at a time, that's another um, option as well. One thing that I did skip here, you could also do um, another couple of strategies called shared or guided learning. And I won't go into that. This stuff here, what we were just talking about then, kind of is shared learning anyway, um, because students are sharing and giving their feedback and putting their answers on the board and you're scribing their answers and so on and so forth. So you're kind of sharing it slash guiding them anyway, and then they you figure out what the process is and then get to practice it again. So again, with all these strategies, we try not to be too... Um, purist about it in the sense that we're going to do a pure shared or a pure um, guided learning strategy if it doesn't suit that particular activity or the particular goals of those um, activities. So the point of that and so far we've got through is the idea that it's highly structured, um, the pace is quite quick, so quite, quite, quite quick. So one of the issues that comes with uh, a lot of 
particularly beginning teachers or teacher aides who are given classes and are given programs and asked to help students is that um, they'll set activities that go for long periods of time. So that's, I call that the set and circulate. That's just a set and set and circulate method and it's very very dangerous and it's a lazy way of teaching but unfortunately a lot of people do teach that way simply because they don't know any better it's not their fault it's just the way that um, they've seen other teachers do it and it seems like the logical and simple way to go about teaching a lesson and what that means is that you might do some modeling you might do some worked examples on the board and then you would set 10 examples or 10 questions get students to go and uh, do those 10 questions and effectively they've got half an hour to go through and work through those examples and then the teacher will circulate around the room. You can imagine that very quickly there are behavioural problems. If you're teaching 32 year 9 students, um, trying to teach them maths or whatever, which I've done quite extensively, I can guarantee you that the set and circulate model will cause problems very, very quickly. It will not take more than six minutes until you've got three or four students that are looking for other ways to entertain themselves, particularly if there's 10 questions you want to get them through. A few students will finish within a matter of moments and some students will barely get started on the first one. So um, now that's not to say that the whole set and circulate model or method isn't effective in some instances but generally speaking, it should be avoided. And it is in contrast, or I use it in contrast to explicit instruction to show how instead of setting an activity and working through 15 questions while, student, while you circulate and spend most of the time trying to control behavior, um, it's actually a lot easier to do a teacher-centered model where it's 30 seconds or 60 seconds on the board, go through the answer, do it again, repeat, repeat, and go through that process. Obviously, the timing that you're using there can change depending on what activity you're doing and the type of students that you've got and what you're trying to achieve. So sometimes it might be 30 seconds, it might be two or three activities of four or five minutes. Students might be working really well, so you might let them go on before without uh, interrupting them. Another type of independent activity is uh, individual work is silent work. So that's another way to go about that process. Another way, uh, another option would be pair and group work. So um, you've got pair, sash, I'll just write SG for small group work. Some type of what I've written over there, whole of class activity, W-O-F, uh, W-O-C, whole of class activity. Now, the whole purpose of these is that you've got some pair work so that students can work together to try and solve a problem or to feed back and forth to each other. Um, you've got some group work, which is usually small group work, but mainly whole of class is where you end up at the very end. So you'll start with modeling at the start of the lesson, move to doing this sort of model where it's individual opportunity to, individual opportunities to practice, um, and then back onto the board, individual opportunities to practice, and back onto the board. Then you might move to some pair work, but sometimes you don't do that and you move straight to pair work. So again, we're starting to get into this um, more of a lesson plan than we are sort of explaining explicit instruction, but generally uh, that's the process that most teachers use, doing some type of board work, individual deliberate practice, and finishing off with some type of whole of class activity at the end, which tries to consolidate learning in some way. That can be a challenge activity, it can be a bit of fun. After about 40 minutes or so, a lot of students are ready to do something that's a bit more fun, get them out of their seat, get them moving around. There's something called MI, which is known as movement integration, um, getting people to move around, to stand up, particularly for early adolescent teenagers, getting them to move around, getting the blood flowing a little bit can help the synapses and things in your brain to acquire knowledge and to be able to remember things um, more so than if you're just sitting there and only seeing it on paper. So um, you can be quite creative in how you go about doing that, bearing in mind the potential behavior management type issues, even if it's one or two students getting them to go for a walk to explain things to each other or whatnot. I think I heard that a lot of Nobel Peace Prize winners say that they come up with most of their answers while they're walking um, and ideas, uh, and then they go and prove it in a lab. So uh, 
I'm not sure where I heard that, but it sounds rather logical to me. So basically, we've gone through structure, we've gone through pace. Pace just means you're doing two minutes of this, three minutes of that, six minutes of that, 30 seconds of that, timed. So usually you're using a lot of counters and timing. Um, it's very, very goal orientated. This is what I need you to know. This is what I need you to learn today. This is what you'll be able to do at the very end of this lesson. Goal orientated. Write the goals on the board. Use a lot of smart goals. Set small micro goals. Goals are really important, again, to help students build their self-esteem and motivation and things like that because a lot of students who are misbehaving quite regularly um, or who are being kicked out of car class all the time, it's because they're experiencing frustration or they are worried or scared that they're going to lose face in front of their uh, friends because they will or they believe they will not be successful. So if you can show students that they can achieve regular goals, um, then that'll go a long way in uh, to preventing a lot of behavioral issues. And the reason I really like explicit instruction is because if you're in a class or taking over a class that has a lot of behavioral problems, starting with explicit instruction, um, is the best option. And from there, you can move into other methods where you're doing longer activities that might involve more student-centered um, type strategies. But to begin with, explicit instruction is a good way to really settle the class down into a nice solid routine uh, and to help develop rapport. And to uh, The other thing with the explicit instruction is that it's very controlled. So by controlled, it doesn't mean the teacher is being nasty or aggressive or yelling or being intimidating. Most teachers doing explicit instruction don't talk any louder than what I'm currently talking right now. But what they are doing is being very controlling. And I don't mean that in a bad way. There is this idea, particularly amongst academics, I guess, and if you read a lot of the research, it is skewed in the direction of student-centered and constructivism being the um, you know, trending be all and end all as far as education is concerned. But a lot of experience and practicing teachers really disagree with that because being in control uh, means that students are on task and they're on task more regularly. And it doesn't mean that we're teaching an old school way, making students uh, rote learn thousands of words in lists that they could never use in any other context. Um, but it does mean that Students are constantly on task and what they are learning and practicing um, is highly controlled by the teacher. So students do one question, then they finish. Then they do the next question, then they, then they finish. But in between each time, the teacher is constantly checking. So um, now this is where uh, there's probably another one that we could add in there called feedback and checking for understanding. I should have added those in anyway. Particularly checking for understanding. So as the teacher is going through these short, sharp activities or the teacher aid, they're constantly checking for understanding. They're constantly using a differentiated instruction model and looking for students who don't know uh, or haven't quite understood certain uh, understood certain concepts and they're making adjustments to the way in which they're going about doing these things. Maybe they're changing the examples around or spending more time on certain aspects, going back and doing more shared or guided learning, pairing students up. There's various different ways that you can go about trying to uh, uh, remediate issues if students are confused at some point. So um, checking for understanding is a constant process that happens in an explicit instruction environment and also feedback. So you're constantly providing feedback to students. Another thing that I would add there is formative. I might have even added it further up, actually. Formative assessment. So for, I don't think I added it further up. No. So formative assessment means that the teacher is, think of formative like informal. It's a type of assessment where the teacher or teacher aide is wandering around, looking at how students are going, getting feedback from them verbally, looking at just whether they look stressed or frustrated or if they're working through things or not, and getting feedback on how things are going. So formative assessment, feedback, checking for understanding, they're all very, uh, very, um, uh, similar things. But not only uh, feedback, by feedback I mean not um, receiving feedback, but providing feedback to students, particularly in terms of their goals, particularly in terms of how they're going. So teachers are always positively prompting um, students to, 
to basically give compliments, but specific compliments, and that builds their uh, motivation. Okay, so the next thing, we've spoken about short, sharp activities. By sharp, I generally mean, sharp is a term, I, when I think of the word short and sharp, short is obvious, you've got two minutes to do something, three minutes to do something, but sharp means that there are clear start and end points. So I like to use the, one of the strategies I write about in my behavior management book is the wait for it, go strategy, where it's like, right, wait for it, go. And then all students go and do a particular activity, whatever that means. It might be packing something up, it might be a transition, it might be um, a maths problem, it might be an essay or whatever, whatever it is, but the teacher starts it and quite clearly ends it at a particular point. And when you, um, at both of those points, all students' eyes are 100% on the teacher. So there's no, or teacher aid, so there's no middle ground where half the, te half the students are off still writing or doing whatever. It's very highly controlled. Um, some teachers have students put their hands on their head, for example, um, or cross their arms or whatever, so that when the teacher's talking, students have stopped, and then they go and they do their work for three minutes, but then they stop. So students also don't feel like they're writing nonstop for two hours. That's very, very sharp. There are sharp edges around the timelines um, of those, I guess you could call them micro activities, right? Um, there's a lot of momentum. Now, momentum keeps the activity exciting, it keeps the activity going, it keeps it students um, in the game, so to speak, so that they don't lose attention. It prevents a lot of behavioral issues. Um, and it's kind of like a byproduct of doing everything else. You can't really force momentum or uh, aim to provide momentum or to yeah, provide momentum, I guess. What you would need to do is just make sure that you're very goal orientated, you're moving through at a relatively good pace. That doesn't mean a fast pace, but well, I guess it does mean a fast pace, but it's not an unreasonable pace. It's a pace where students are keeping up, that they're happy, that they're excited, and they can see that the lesson is moving. Um, they're going from activity to activity, but they're not necess they're not rushing. So that's the important point there. Okay. Now we've already spoken about the different, I guess you could call them classifications of activities. So other way of classifying activities, you can do individual activities, pair activities, group activities, say small group activities, um, and whole of class activities. So they're the different options that you've got in that sort of model, in that process there. Generally you would do modeling, some type of shared and guided. Um, after that you might do pair work, individual work, whole of class activity or a game or a quiz, and then some type of revision slash consolidation at the very end. And also, sorry, one thing I missed before that modeling is an intro at the start. So I'll just write all those down for those that need to know it very quickly. Okay, so the basic process of explicit instruction is your intro, modeling, which I've done videos on modeling, Three is shared or guided or both, usually both. Learning. Uh, and then from number four, let's say we do pair work. And then number five, let's say we do, say, individual uh, deliberate practice or purposeful practice or just some individual silent work. So you can get students to do some writing to learn type activity. So um, also sometimes teachers get students to do this at the start. So it could be a bit of a revision. If you want them to just practice writing, just to get into the habit of writing, sometimes, so you can mix things up. This is a pretty simple sort of process. And of course, over time, again, you can play around with it and whatnot. So pair work, then you've got some, I'll call that silent pair work, silent individual work. Um, and you might do some group or whole of class, whole of class activity which is quite often a game or a brainstorm or a quiz. Kids love quizzes at all ages. And then you're going to have some type of conclusion, which is also like a revision -y type thing. So you want to revise stuff and, and summarize it all and so forth. So you do that at the very end. Obviously, throughout that, you're adding in all of these different elements. So they're just different, I guess, types or classifications of activities but you're, it's highly structured. So you can see 
if there was a 40 minute lesson, now say a one hour lesson, and you got, let's make it easy, 70 minute lesson, you've got 10 minutes for each of those. Although you wouldn't purposefully structure it in that way, but um, you, you get the point that you have to work through them pretty quick if you're gonna do 10 minutes of each. Now, um, you would add in and make sure that the pace was there. So three minutes for this, two minutes for that. You're moving through really quickly. Um, it's timed. And, and I like to be uh, really pedantic with my timing. I think you don't have to do it all the time, but if you can say, right, my clock is just over there. I've got three minutes to get through this, go. And students literally know that they got three minutes. You can use timers. Um, so get in the habit of using timers and timing students and stick to what you say. Because if you say 60 seconds and you let students go for four minutes, then students are, I always say students are professional students. This is what they do for a living effectively. It's how they earn their tucker is being a professional student. So if, if, you're, if you're telling them fibs, then um, they'll catch on to that very quick. They are, as I say, professional students. They learn how you operate and um, if you're kind of flippant with your timing, then um, they just won't believe you. Next time you tell them they got three minutes to go before we have to pack up and do something else, they'll, um, they just won't believe you and they'll continue on or they'll complain or whatever. So uh, timing is really important. It's highly controlled, obviously. That doesn't mean you're being nasty or intimidating or anything, but it means it's highly structured and controlled and every students will do this and then they'll be instructed to do that. They'll get feedback. You'll check for understanding and so forth. That will maintain and keep the momentum going. Um, you'll use a range of different strategies here, which we've already mentioned. Um, we've already done these bottom things there. So plenty of feedback to students. Check for understanding constantly and formative um, assessment, which is just a fancy way of saying that you're checking for understanding, really. Um, and you're doing the revision and consolidation activities at the end. Uh, the one thing we probably haven't put in there is goals. So oh, we have put it over here, but your goals always go there. Okay, so that goal goes down to there. So generally, with as far as goals are concerned, you can move them in between, but generally speaking, goals are usually set and communicated to students here, and uh, there's some type of revision or conclusion activity down the bottom there to consolidate learning, to summarize everything, and to make the decision or the assessment about whether you actually met the goals that were first stated. And you won't always meet them, um, and that's perfectly fine, provided you've then got a plan to try and meet them uh, in the future. But it's important for students to come into a lesson know that they're there for a particular purpose, work towards achieving something, and then be able to have something at the end to be able to show for it. Uh, so, um, right, now, so over here, we've gone through opportunities to respond and opportunities to practice a little bit, but let's just touch on that one final time. Now, some of the research that I've read recently has showed that teachers ask, um, hot, well, quality teachers or high high performing teachers ask around about 400 questions per day, assuming they're on class all day. Now that's a lot of questions when you think about it, but what that says is that high performing teachers are giving students plenty of opportunities to respond. And what that means is they're asking lots of questions. Now let me give you one example. Obviously you can go and watch my video about questioning techniques, but um, one of the main one one of the many concepts in uh, the questioning techniques, um, video that I talk about is uh, wait time. Now wait time is a universal technique I guess that all teachers will be aware of, almost all anyway, and what that basically means is that you'll pose a question and then wait say 10 seconds or something like that, 5 seconds, 15 seconds, so that all students have to think about and come up with an answer because all students will be aware of and will know that they might be the one that gets picked or chosen to have to um, explain their thinking or explain their answer to the class. So uh, that's why opportunities to respond are so important. And also what that research shows us is that high performing teachers are using explicit instruction. They're using um, lots or a variation of it or lots of elements of it um, as well because, uh, well, anyway, we won't get into that. Now opportunities to practice, which largely happens here and here and to an extent there, to an extent there. Opportunities to practice just means that students get plenty of um, chances to be able to practice these questions over and over again. So there's another strategy called massed practice. 
and another one called spaced, which is the opposite of mass practice, by the way. So it's important that um, it's important that you understand those two concepts, particularly space practice, because that's a really good one to know. But mass practice basically means you'll take a question like that and get students to complete 10 questions really quick in a few minutes or whatever. Because sometimes um, you can go through all the fancy techniques and strategies and so forth, but quite often what really works and what's a really good thing to do towards the end of a lesson is to say, right, what I would like everyone to do is to spend... 10 minutes answering these 10 quick questions at a million miles an hour to really just nail that down and just practice it. It's sort of like if you were teaching someone to play golf. At some point, you want them to actually just hit 50 or 60 balls to just practice in quick succession um, implementing the types of things that you've been talking about and doing little bits and pieces of um, throughout. Uh, there's another... There's another strategy called whole part whole learning, uh, which is also another one that you should look up uh, if you're interested about learning some of the different strategies that you can apply in this explicit um, instruction uh, model. So the other thing I will point out is that from a timing perspective, you will get through a lot of, you don't have to do all of these. This is just more of, I guess, the traditional way of working through the program or working through that mod that type of explicit instruction model, but you don't have to follow that process. You can mix it up. You can get students to do silent individual work at the start. A lot of language or English teachers do that. They'll come in and do um, just a little bit of writing, writing to learn as they call it, or um, stream of consciousness writing at the start for 10 or 15 minutes, just six minutes, whatever it is, silently writing about whatever they want to write about. Um, not assessing that writing at all, but just getting into the habit of just writing and practicing their writing. Um, so you can mix it up and do various different things. This just gives you um, a good solid means of approaching a class, particularly if it's a challenging class. Now, um, personally, I follow this relatively, not strictly, because sometimes you never get a chance to do some of these other things and then you might do them later on. Just to give you an indication or just to work this out for mathematically, right? Like if your intro and model part takes, say, 10 minutes, your conclusion and revision part takes 10 minutes, assuming there are no interruptions or the students aren't really asking that many questions and you don't have any admin type things that need to be taken care of as well. If you've got a 60 minute lesson, you take 10 and 10, you've only got 40 minutes left. Now, if you use that real pure explicit instruction model where it's like, here's the mass question, you've got two minutes, and then we go through it. Bear in mind, if you're gonna get a student to come up on the board to write an answer, it's gonna take them 30 seconds, they'll go through it, they might get it wrong, you'll need to get another student, da 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 So if you said it takes five minutes, and you've only got 40, well, that actually gives you eight minutes. That gives you eight minutes per, um, no, sorry. No, not eight minutes. It's five minutes per question and you've got 40 minutes. I don't know what I'm good doing there. Maybe I need another copy. Um, that gives you eight questions. Yeah, I thought that was strange. So you've got, you can only get through eight questions, assuming you've got 10 minutes there and 10 minutes there. Even if these were shorter, that eight questions is going to only be five or six. So the lesson just goes like that. It sounds like it's very difficult and very laborious and repetitive. But trust me, if you've been in an explicit instruction classroom with someone who knows how to do it properly, um, it's not boring at all. It's very quick. It's very exciting and very fast paced. Um, and it's very controlled and it's very easy to run from a teacher's perspective because while you think the set and circulate model would be easier because there's less uh, less of a need for the teacher to be at the front with everyone staring and having to control behavior while delivering a lesson. I mean, actual fact, because it's so fast paced and because there's a momentum and it's short, sharp activities and so forth, um, the lesson just flies like that and you'll only get a small amount of work done, but it'll be quality teaching, quality teaching time and quality um, learning time as well. Uh, once upon a time, I used to teach year eight, nine, well, I used to teach high school maths, even though I'm not a high school teacher. And at this particular school, the lessons would go for about two hours, right? I kid you not, two hours. So they'd have two hour blocks. Um, and I used to do a lot of quizzes, which sort of falls into this category here. Uh, and they would take about, say, 40 minutes for a quiz. You'd still have, so that'd be the first activity I'd do. That'd be the second activity I'd do. 
No, I probably wouldn't do that. But I mean, and that's basically an hour gone of a two hour lesson. So you don't always have to follow this process. Of course, I didn't do a quiz every single time, but you can see how that back and forth explicit instruction model where it's um, students are doing an answer, uh, coming up, working something out, and then you're coming back on the board and working it out somehow and going through it as a class. You can see how that in a way is basically a quiz, right? So what I used to do with this class, it was a very challenging class, um, is I'd have a quiz of say 10 and students would win maybe a little prize or whatnot and we'd do that about once a week. So if you've got students for maths for four, say four or five hours, um, an hour of that or 20 odd percent of that gets taken up by doing a quiz. But you use that to consolidate everything that you've learned in the past and to cons or the last few weeks or whatever or that particular chapter to introduce the basics and foundational knowledge for new topics but also just to engage kids and get them motivated and to get them excited and to get their attendance up and to have them achieve some goals and to get things right even if it's um, and to get some positive feedback, even if it's not feedback necessarily related to the particular topic. So, Because for a lot of those students, they'd experienced nothing but failure for their entire educational career. So it was about building that confidence back up so that we got their attendance up so that they started to engage more um, and started to attempt more activities than they otherwise would have and the behavior slowly decreased until, I mean, you can never completely eradicate all behavioral issues in highly challenging classrooms, but you can do a lot to address it and gradually improve it over a period of time um, by not only doing behavior management type techniques, but also by implementing some of those basic explicit instruction uh, strategies. But that just goes to show that you can move things around and change things around and do it in various different ways. It doesn't have to be that traditional sort of explicit instruction process. So that is pretty much all I have to say on that one. And uh, if you're doing that with an individual student or a group of students or a whole class uh, of students, just remember all the different concepts there and um, that's explicit instruction.